Welcome everyone to the Herbert C. Kelman seminar on international conflict. Um, and thank you for taking the time out today. I know everybody's busy these days and to uh, come and, and spend a, an hour with us and, and uh, we're really grateful that you, you've um, taken the time. I just wanna remind you that this um, seminar is co-sponsored by the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School and the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Um, we are delighted to have our, our colleague, uh, Tim Phillips here to talk about some of the science uh, behind conflict. Um, and, but before I introduce him and go into all of what Tim is gonna be talking about, I just wanna give you a sense of the format. What we're gonna do is turn the, um, the table to Tim for about 35 to 40 minutes. And then after which he will um, answer some questions or comments. And if you decide to, um, to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A function. Because what I'm gonna do is go through the questions. Um, I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them. We have a very full uh, audience here today, but um, I will try my best at getting uh, to most of the, the questions. And then we will, um, and Tim will answer well, one by one, he'll answer the questions. And then just a few minutes before ending, I'm gonna turn the, um, the, the talk over to Nicole Bryant, who is the um, managing director at PON. And she's gonna just update people, you all on um, upcoming events. And before we start, I do wanna thank uh, Diane Long and Lindsay Sullivan, uh, James Kerwin and certainly uh, Nicole Bryant. Uh, all of us, we're, we're a team, we work together and uh, we just love presenting this uh, material to all of you. So thank you once again for coming. And um, I wanna give you a little bit of background, uh, Tim's background. As you know, he's gonna be talking, the title of his talk is, what, are, what we're learning from behavioral science about a world in conflict. So Tim has a uh, pretty amazing background. He's uh, a leader in the field of conflict resolution and reconciliation. And he was also, is also the founder of Beyond Conflict, a global nonprofit that has created powerful and innovative frameworks to open pathways for progress in peace talks, transitions to democracy and national reconciliation in the aftermath of division and violence in dozens of countries around the world. Under Tim's leadership, Beyond Conflict has catalyzed the field of behavioral science and social conflict and partners with scientists and practitioners to bring forward new evidence-based strategies to reduce conflict, increase tolerance, and facilitate positive social change in the United States and abroad. Tim has advised the United Nations, the US Department of State, the Council of Europe, and helped launch the Club of Madrid, a forum of 120 former democratic heads of state and government who work to strengthen global democracy and institutions. Tim was educated at Suffolk University, the London School of Economics, and was awarded in 2008 with an honorary doctorate from Suffolk University. That was in 2018. Thank you, Tim. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Donna. And I want to thank um, Diane Long um, and the program of negotiation and everybody who invited me and helped facilitate this presentation today. Um, but uh, I also want to thank everybody for taking the time to be part of this presentation today. And the way I'm thinking about it is really as a conversation and a presentation, um, as to why Beyond Conflict and I as a non-scientist started going to brain and behavioral science. Um, and I, I think, and more collectively, we think it applies to the range of quite existential challenges we're facing um, here in the United States and around the world. So let me give you a little background. And if you can go to the next slide, Lindsay, just for those who don't know us. And um, as Donna mentioned, we were started in 1992 as an organization at the end of the Cold War in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and it was really with a very simple and I think hopefully modest idea that at the end of the Cold War, when you had all these newly emerging democracies and former dissidents 
who are now stepping in to run these new democratic uh, states, how did they begin to deal with their past? So in 1991, 92, when a lot of these transitions were happening, there was a lot of support coming in from the outside world about how do you build democratic institutions? How do you design democratic constitutions, hold democratic elections, or even uh, in that case, build uh, market economies? But what few people were helping leaders in that region confront is how do you deal with the legacy of the past? How do you deal with the legacy of living under, whether it's 50 years or 70 years, repression, um, whether in the former Soviet Union or Central and Eastern Europe? And also, what do you do with people who had committed human rights abuses? What do you do with people who may have been collaborators, even within your own families? And then a very specific issue was, how do you deal with all these state security files, which dictatorships have a very good habit of creating uh, and leaving behind when they collapse? And so at the outset was a very simple idea that, you know, in these transitions to democracy, uh, was, the world was a very different place in 1992 compared to today. Um, there was a sense that I and others had that in order to really step into these democratic countries, these leaders um, who again were former dissidents uh, and in many cases victims of the prior regime, how did they deal as individuals with the legacy of repression? And I was curious about not only how do they deal with it as individuals, but as communities, because you could have these democratic structures and institutions, but can you actually inhabit them as individuals and communities? where you really become, in a sense, sovereign members of a democratic state. And so with that sort of simple belief, I started looking for funding and uh, met George Soros, who I had never heard of in 1991-92. This is before he really became quite famous for a lot of his, his philanthropic support for democratic transitions. And it was this very simple idea. Let's bring together in Europe leaders from countries before who struggled in the transition from dictatorship to democracy that existed in the early 90s. And the models that existed were Argentina, Chile, other countries in South America, the experience of Germany at, after the Second World War, denazification, or for example, the transition in Spain from the Franco dictatorship to democracy. And so rooted at the very beginning of our work, starting in 1992, was the power of this shared human experience that people can learn from the experience of others. I've always felt that there are no unique conflicts in the world. Every conflict will have its own unique characteristics, but at the end of the day, people respond to whether it's repression, fear, violence on a human level, you know, to be dehumanized, to be marginalized, to be humiliated, are deeply personal, emotionally based, biological uh, states of being and feeling. And we know what that can lead to uh, time and time again. So I wanted to give you that background because it leads to how we started looking at brain and behavioral science. And I should say that in 1991, 92, when I was talking to people in the United States as funders or people to come and participate or in Western Europe, just the simple notion that people can learn from the experience of others. Some people immediately uh, accepted that, but there were a lot of people who struggle with that. So there is no cross-cultural learning. The, the, the experiences of Eastern Europe were very different than Chile or even Spain in Europe and, and Central Europe. And it struck me then, I said, you know, as I said earlier, people don't respond to the legacy of dictatorship through their national identity card. It's on a human level. So that sort of, I guess, intuition then guided and shaped what became our approach of shared experience. And because it's rooted in the belief that humans can learn from the experience of others, and empirically, that's what shaped our work through the shared uh, experience methodology. When I get to why we started looking at brain and behavioral science, it was sort of an organic transition uh, to that process. So maybe if you just go to the next slide. So just again, as a little background. So I mentioned the shared experience met methodology of conflict resolution and reconciliation. I should add that uh, as a good friend of mine who Donna knows, Jose Maria Argueta often says, Conflict resolution is a misnomer. It's really about conflict management. And I think that is so true. Conflict is inherent in human nature. We all know it, not just within states, but within families. It's like polarization is inherent as well. So it's, you know, it's really about how do we manage uh, these tensions that we all experience? 
Then we helped in our early days catalyze what became the field of transitional justice in the early 90s, really about how do you deal with your past. Then we had the uh, privilege in the early 90s of helping facilitate with partners in South Africa the conversations that led to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission there. And then as uh, Donna mentioned, uh, back in 2010, time flies, started looking to brain and behavioral science. And let me just sort of you know, transition there. So before we started doing work, which I'll mention in the United States, we started looking at how do we understand why there are so many intractable conflicts in the world? Why were so many peace agreements remaining fragile? And were there any really durable peace agreements? And you know, in our toolkit through the shared experience methodology, it was rooted in the experience of individuals. It was very much, you know, community, nation-based um, process of engagement. As an American, I felt like I had the capacity or or the privilege of setting a table, sort of curating conversations. But the people speaking were people from other countries who had struggled with similar challenges. And so at the outset in 1991-92, the focus was on transitions from dictatorship to democracy. But then with the transitions we started seeing at the end of the Cold War, there were a lot of countries trying to go from conflict to peace. And so we incorporated those sort of transitions in the process as well, and built over a period of time a network of over two to 300 leaders at different levels of a country on opposite sides who had been through something personally transformative for them, in many cases, their own nation and their own community. And so using that sort of model of sort of a support group on wheels, we started bringing them uh, to countries from Northern Ireland to Central America, to the Middle East and elsewhere, helping share that experience and sort of curating conversations that we felt would help people have not just an aha moment, but begin to see that other people have struggled like they have and found a way through. And so in 2010, I was teaching a course with a colleague of mine over at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and it was called Conflict Transformation in the 20th Century, or 21st Century, time flies, um, the human dimension. And every other class had have a speaker come in. And one class, I had Jerry Adams come in from Northern Ireland. Now, some of you may know that he was one of the leaders of Sinn Féin, and frankly, of the Irish Republican Army. And... In this particular class, a student raised her hand and asked the question, how do you sit across the table from somebody you may have tried to kill, or they may have killed somebody close to you? And Jerry paused and he said, it's tough to make peace with a humiliated partner. And there was a retired neuroscientist sitting in the room. He had been observing the classes. He was in his mid seventies. And he came up to me after that class and said, you know, there's a lot of brain and behavioral science research of these themes of humiliation, empathy, and fear that had been brought up in the previous sessions. And I said to him, what do you mean the brain science piece? And he said something so powerful. He said, while well, speaking as a scientist, he says, we are not rational beings with emotions. In fact, we're just the opposite. We're emotionally based beings who can only think rationally when we feel that our identities, as we see them, are understood and valued by others. And I just have one of those you know, moments of just stillness. And that, that quote, that phrase just captured everything I had experienced, not just in my work, but you know, growing up and in my own personal journey. And then of course, you know, I then picked his brain for three or four weeks and started learning some really foundational insights about the human brain and human cognition. And one of the benefits where I'm based in Boston and Cambridge is there are some great universities with amazing scientists working in the cognitive and behavioral sciences. And I started to explore with colleagues these conversations. And one of the key things that came through among the many key insights, including from Donna Hicks, who's trained in social psychology and really helped me understand these issues uh, 14 years ago and earlier, was that we needed to focus on how we think as humans and not what we think. Because more than 90% of how we think as humans is below the level of conscious access. That we think automatically in milliseconds, we think in groups, and we think of men and mental models of the world. 
And the more I engage with these incredible scientists and many young emerging scientists like Rebecca Sachs or Emile Bruneau, who later became our lead scientist uh, and unfortunately passed away from cancer just a few years ago and a true loss to all of us, was they would say to me, wow, your work is great. You obviously have had an impact in different countries, but do you know why you're having that impact? Do you understand how the brain actually works? What would happen if you understood the key psychological processes that advance pro-social peaceful change or mitigated it or led people into fear, violence, and deeper division? What if you actually knew more about how the neural passages or the neural synapses of the brain worked? And it just struck me, you know, they were asking me questions like funders would ask, which is, how do you know you're having an impact? And in the early mid-90s, I would say to funders, well, I don't know how you measure the way people think, but you certainly can see it if they begin to engage with their adversary enemy, if they actually start negotiating a peace agreement and are successful, or they found a way to begin to deal with their past, or X, Y, and Z. And yet here I was hearing from Emil and Rebecca in 2010, actually you can measure the way we think, and you can begin to unpack how the brain works and how human cognition and emotion actually works and advance real change. And one of the key takeaways when I was in graduate school, one of the reasons I didn't pursue a PhD is I, a, I felt I couldn't really be an academic and do justice to that calling. But also it struck me that, you know, there was something wrong with the enlightenment. And here I was learning from these brilliant scientists and others that, you know, in many ways the enlightenment got it wrong. Not everything, but a significant part that we are not reason rationally based beings where emotions get in the way. In fact, we're emotionally based beings where our unconscious brain shapes a core part of our ability to even think with reason and rationality. And I remember one of the scientists um, at MIT said that we're actually producing and graduating PhDs in political science and economics who are still fundamentally taught that humans are rational beings. And yet here in the same university, we know it's just the opposite. And I sat back and I thought, you know, as somebody working at that point, mostly globally, but beginning to look domestically in the United States, we spend so much time and effort trying to advance real change, trying to advance, you know, whether it's greater tolerance, coexistence, cooperation, um, healthier democracies, healthier citizens within democracies. How do we deal with our past? How do we deal with the role that identity both plays and how we shape and navigate ourselves in the world, but how it can be manipulated and weaponized by others. And yet here, here I'm hearing from scientists that a lot of the reason why some of those, not all, are failing is because it's not rooted in truly understanding human cognition and emotion. And I remember, and I'll transition from there, that a very senior uh, political scientist in MIT said to me after one of our conferences, and the conference was on norms, narratives, and neurons. She said, we make so many assumptions about human nature in political science and the broader social sciences, and we discount cognition and emotion. And I'm reading this email thinking, well, what else is there? We either think or we feel. And so it just struck me again and again that what we really needed to do was dive deeply into brain and behavioral science see what is already established and known, and then can we initiate new research and actually bring it to the world in a very evidence-based, usable and accessible way. Now that was a big undertaking. And so in the beginning, working with MIT, Harvard, and NYU, and many colleges and, 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 and labs around the world, I started building this community of particularly emerging generation of brain and behavioral scientists and political scientists and practitioners and people from communities that are most impacted by conflict into this conversation to say, what can we learn? Because there has to be a better way. And so that's a bit of the background that I wanted to share. And so if we could go to the next slide. So what did we start to do? Well, I mentioned we built partnerships and relationships with brain and behavioral scientists. We connected them to the real world. So as Emil used to say, there was conflict-informed science, 
but real world informed science. How do you bridge those most in need in the world with the resources and the skills and really the commitment of scientists to bring what they know to the world? And one of the things that Emil said to me before he passed away a few years ago, that you could be doing really major work on some level of cell science, molecular science, and have a discovery that through clinical trials, through pharmaceutical, biotech, medical research could potentially save a life. But if you're working in brain and behavioral science and you make an important discovery about the nature of the humanization, for example, that we process disgust differently in the brain than fear, or the nature of empathy, or even the research that a number of people have done on sacred values, things that we hold, not just religious, but sacred to our identity as individuals and communities, is process in a different region of the brain than utilitarian calculations. But there's no connective tissue to bring that to the world. And so what we try to do in our Beyond Conflict Innovation Lab and partnerships is model what that could look like, to give a model of engaging with science in the service of real world impact, but not just being it lopsided, where it's science and not those most impacted. And we have a belief in Beyond Conflict that to learn about your brain is agency enabling because every human is interested in knowing how their brain works and how it navigates the world around them. So one of the things we did is we started looking back in 2014 at deepening polarization in the United States. So at that point, Emil had moved to UPenn. We were able to raise some funding. We hired two full-time postdocs. And we started looking at how polarization was being shaped in the United States and at the same time, what we could do about it. And not surprising, but this is where a behavioral science approach is informative, is that when polarization becomes identity-based, then a whole range of uh, psychological processes, unconscious psychological processes come online that serve only to drive us further apart. And you only have to look at this country, the United States, to see that at play. And we said, okay, that's important to know and at least understand and frame to begin to explain how polarization is being shaped in this country. But what do we do about it? And so we did the equivalent of a hackathon, uh, uh, what we called an intervention tournament, and said, okay, are there bodies of research that we could test in an intervention to see if we can actually do something about this? And one of the things that we looked at is the research around meta misperceptions. So the human brain evolved to be predictive and not reactive. We're all the descendants of those humans who didn't pause in what is now East Africa and ask, is that a pride of lions? Those who did were eaten. So we are all the descendants and not just humans, all living beings on this planet navigate their physical and social environment to some extent. And so this predictive brain that all humans have depends on input, a lot of it's socially constructed. And the more we are isolated from others, meta misperceptions ends up playing a bigger role. And we did a series of surveys and found, and it's still consistent, that Democrats and the Republican and Republicans in the United States overestimate by half the gap between them on big issues like you see here immigration gun control, abortion, even on feelings of being disliked by the other side and feeling dehumanized. So if you think others see you as less than human, well, not only do I have nothing in common with them, they are a profound threat. And so by finding and consistently other surveys we now others are doing following this research is seeing that these misperceptions are quite significant and by the way, they're not unique to the United States. They're part of the human experience. But here's what's really exciting about this research. It gives us a window to engage, to say, how do we begin to let people know that they share more, they have more in common, but they don't know it. And on our website, you can see a video we did where we brought in a, an Emmy award-winning filmmaker with our researchers to create a six-minute video in which during COVID, we interviewed Representative Trump and Biden supporters and asked the same questions that we did in this original study, and then record with their permission, their response. 
Then that was tested. It's called vicarious contact online. And then we found that it had a significant impact in reducing support for political violence in the United States. And then Stanford University Strengthening Democracy Challenge invited a whole series of uh, submissions. And that video was ranked number one over close to 500 for reducing support for political violence. And one of the things that we've all seen who do conflict reconciliation related work is that it takes time when you bring people who are in conflict to begin to see the other as not only just equal to some extent, but human and begin to feel more safe in that engagement. And it took a lot of that engagement for that shift to happen. What I'm excited about in this research about meta misperceptions, if you can do surveys ahead of time and correct that before people come in engagement, I think you can make huge progress. Now we need to test that more, but I'm pretty certain that will have a positive impact because we've seen it in different settings. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier that Emil and Rebecca Sachs said to me in 2010, if you could actually understand the psychological processes at play and actually develop and test interventions, in the real world and see if you can actually measurably improve those outcomes, then you could take something that could take years of engagement and collapse into a shorter period of time. So if we can go to the next slide. And by the way, I'm giving this an overview. This is 15 years of work and, and happy to talk further. So we did the America's Divided Mind Report in 2019. And I'm happy to say that, um, and I know Emil and other scientists would be appreciative of this, though wasn't my initial goal, that that research and many misperceptions is shaping how a lot of behavioral scientists and political scientists and others start to look at deepening identity-based polarization. What we need to do though, is make sure it doesn't just sit in the lab or just sit in a peer reviewed uh, publication, but gets out the world with real testing and evidence behind them. So in 2020, after the election here in the United States, we then looked at, um, okay, what else is driving potentially our disunity? And to be clear, after 2020, um, a lot of Americans even more supported than President Trump after four years of his time in the, in the White House. So what are we missing? And one of the things we found, and it's not surprising, is that demographic and cultural change in the United States matched to increasing economic inequality, history of racism and many other dynamics are adding to our disunity. And partly because it's been manipulated, particularly by the right for decades now of fear of change. And here's the thing, we look and said, okay, what are scientists telling us? They're saying every human is always aware of their social and physical environment. And that happens mostly unconsciously. That's the predictive brain at play. And again, when you're isolated, when you're now dealing with media markets, social media, other forms of polarization, it's not difficult, unfortunately. And it's not, again, unique to the United States for fear of the other to be weaponized in really um, dangerous ways. Several years ago, when we were having a conversation uh, with some scientists around our work on dehumanization, I asked the question, well, we know where fear is processed in the brain, but where is hope processed? And it was a question they couldn't answer. But ironically now, and not just ironically, uh, powerfully, there are researchers around the world who are starting to figure that out. So we know where dehumanization is processed, but do we know where humiliation is processed? And so these are questions that, you know, may seem simple, but they're actually quite profound because we know that humiliation, dehumanization, fear, are force multipliers and can be manipulated. And the more we understand how they're playing in the brain and actually have real evidence about then what you can do about it, I think we can make some real significant change. And so identity threat, competitive victimhood, and feelings of exclusion combined do under on, undermine our, our democracy. So if we can go to the next slide. I mentioned our work on dehumanization. So several years ago, we were talking to, uh, we did a first conference at MIT in 2010 on neuroscience and social conflict. And then the second one a year later, as we're trying to build this field, focus on dehumanization. 
And we picked dehumanization because there was some existing research in behavioral science and political science about dehumanization. And we also brought in people who could speak to their direct experience of dehumanization, including the head of the Soros Foundation's Roma Initiative, who was a Roma from Serbia at the time. And one of the most important things that came out for me as a layperson and others is that dehumanization in a very basic way is how we as humans navigate our social environment because our brain's capacity to fully under connect with, empathize, humanize others is limited. The brain, I think anytime has 20 to 25% of the energy output in the body is going to service the brain. And it's not like this endless loop of energy is being produced. And so, you know, we don't literally, from a sort of a mechanical, biological point of view, have the capacity to be fully engaged with this growing, changing world around us. In some ways, our brain hasn't fundamentally changed in, in, in eons, in 20, 30,000 years. I mean, it does change, but the basic structure of the brain hasn't changed much since the Pleistocene. And so we're living in a world that's much bigger, uh, much more difficult to navigate. And it goes back to the predictive brain. How do we navigate this world? And we depend on context as a key way of navigating it. And so we did research on dehumanization. And this report, which would be uh, put in the link, is very helpful because it breaks it down and then asks the question, what do we do about it? And here are some recommendations. And we've spent the last five years working with colleagues in Nigeria, developing science-informed media interventions. And, and, and the, one of the benefits of doing science research before developing the media intervention, we went in wondering if what's happening in Nigeria between Christian and Muslim communities is driven by dehumanization or fear. Now, you may wonder, what's the difference? Well, we process, I mentioned earlier, disgust in the brain differently than fear. So imagine, I know this is going to be disgusting, but it's the nature of disgust. You're on a plane and you're in an aisle seat and somebody comes by and they sneeze next to you. What do you do? You retract and you push away. It's a pathogen threat. It's a viral threat. It's ancient in our, in our species. And, you know, what if you're on the plane and a bully, and I had a few growing up, came on the plane. What you do is you put your head down and you look away. These are two different cognitive affective responses in the brain, disgust and fear. And knowing what's at play is really important in terms of the interventions you design. And what we found in Nigeria is that Christians and Muslims in Nigeria weren't dehumanizing the other. They weren't seeing them as less than human. They were just fearful for a whole set of reasons. And that actually shaped the intervention that we've been doing for five years, which I'm happy to share later. So if we go to the next slide. So the other thing is one of my colleagues, Mike Nikonchuk, um, spent four years in the Zatri refugee camp in Jordan. And what he did there was see that a lot of the sort of psychosocial mental health support was limited. It wasn't culturally nuanced. Um, you can imagine all the challenges to support people who had been through and still going through some pretty horrendous life experiences. And so what we did in this case with funding is we developed with our Syrian colleagues, so they were partners in the design of this, wrote a story, and then each chapter would describe a man and a woman leaving Syria during the, the war, what they were experiencing, whether it be suicidal thoughts, fear, anger, you know, shame, stigma. You can imagine the whole, you know, combination of these. And then the next section would say, well, here's what's happening in your brain in an accessible way. And the power of that is to recognize, as many of these colleagues did in others in other settings, that, wait a minute, if other humans had gone through what we went through, they would feel the same way? Yes. It has a huge positive physiological, emotional um, impact. It reduces stress. We even did a randomized control test looking at the different ways we can use this knowledge through a book, through an app and teaching and training and found that it had a significant impact in reducing cortisol stress levels and so forth. And so we're adapting this in Central America with partners, even here in the United States and other countries around the world. So in each case, we're either going to existing knowledge and working with communities most impacted, bringing together researchers, developing and testing new interventions, 
and with the goal of getting these out there in the world and showing other people that you can address, whether it's understanding dehumanization and its impact on us, understanding deepening identity-based polarization, understanding increasing trauma and mental health challenges, whether it be you know, displaced populations or even communities here in the United States that are from here and are still struggling. So what I wanted to give you here is a bit of a bit of an overview of why we went to brain and behavioral science. But I want to leave and then we can go to questions. Why is this important? It's clear to us, whether you're living in the United States or living around the world anywhere, that we need to think and find a better way to deal with the challenges we face. At their core, they're about how we see ourselves as individuals, families, and communities. Our identities, when they are under threat, um, how do we navigate these emotional minefields around us? How do we understand when we're being manipulated? And how do we actually center ourselves? You know, and, 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 and this is where the field guide is also helpful, and breathe into who we are and, and get to a place of real sort of safety. The world, I'm afraid, is be, going to be, I'm an optimist, you have to be in this line of work optimistic, but we have to be really focused on, well, so much of this isn't working. Why? And I take it back to because we're still burdened by a framework that at the core believes humans are rational beings. We can be rational, but it's shaped by that unconscious brain that we discount. And we owe it to ourselves, to our families, our communities, and future generations that we need to understand what science is telling us. But not just science on its own, but science in partnership, because it is agency enabling for individuals to learn about themselves, to better navigate the world around them. And so maybe I'll leave there and we can go to questions, Don. I think I'm probably way over time, but um, thank you for joining. And uh, I'd be happy if anybody wants to follow up to give more information. No, Tim, you're fine. Um, I just don't know why my video isn't showing. Um, maybe- uh, You are showing, Donna. I am showing? Yep. Okay, there I am. Okay, yes, excellent. That's I was just gonna ask Lindsay to turn off the um, um, slides. Um, okay, start my video, let me do that. Excellent, there we are. Well, Tim, thank you, thank you so much. I'm, you know, I mean, this is just like a little amuse-bouche, you know, it's a little temptation for all of us who are interested and who have been interested in, in so long with trying to, you know, create opportunities to understand what's going, oh, darn, why is that stopping? All right, can you see me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But no, I, I just thank you. And um, for those of us who have been interested in understanding the relationship between brain science and what we know, especially about identity conflicts, especially about dehumanization um, and humiliation. Uh, so I, this, um, this presentation has really, I think, opened a lot of opportunities for people to delve more deeply into the science of all of these issues that have plagued us, you know, from the Pleistocene. So maybe, maybe if we get ahead of this a little bit, we can actually, um, we can have an impact and I know you already have. So thank you for everything that you've done here um, in Beyond Conflict. All right, so I, I'm trying to, I'm looking here um, at the questions. Let's see what's the first one I'm seeing. Um, first would like to thank both Tim and Donna Hicks as well as all participants. My question is what are the roles of innate behavior and learned behavior to solve conflict in human history? Since 1992, there are, uh, there are magnitude conflicts around the globe, such as Rwanda, genocide, Darfur conflict in Sri Lanka, et cetera, Colombia, Ukraine now, and Russia. How could you predict the major conflict which may be happening in the future in relation to behavior and what is best way to overcome conflict in the era of the 21st century? Um, how can you predict whatever your 
you know, conflict may come our way uh, in the future. Um, well, th th these are big and and uh, and and uh, important questions. So let me just step back um, and and maybe put out a few points that I think follow up to my point about what we we need to understand what science is telling us. And by the way, what science is telling us is often affirmed by experiences of people and communities around the world. So it's not that science is telling us that we're getting a lot of this wrong. What science can tell us is, yes, this is right, and here are the reasons why, or here where it's, here's where it's not working. Um, one of the most important things I learned um, from scientists early on is that we all have, it goes back to what uh, happened in that course with Jerry Adams. We all have not just a psychological, but a biological necessity to feel understood. And the thing is feel understood as we see ourselves. Now, from the outside, objectively, you know, people may look at a person and say, well, that's not what's happening. But how you feel, how you see things, even if you recognize your privilege is a subjective felt experience. And when people feel acknowledged and seen, it doesn't mean you're just confirming and sort of cementing their self view. It actually opens up a space for change. We know, for example, Mina Chikara, who's doing great work at Harvard as a cognitive scientist, finds that when you correct people's metamorphous perceptions, it creates a cognitive shift. That people are more willing to think more reasonably or reasonably um, about, about difficult issues. And so to, uh, what I, I just want to want to step back and say, is there an overarching framework for answering some of these questions that people have? So one is we need to feel understood as we see ourselves. It's not just a sort of personal, but it's, it's a biological necessity, particularly when you feel under threat, when you have been feel, have felt marginalized in any category for a period of time. And that exists not just for us, but people we may have profound differences with. And when I say to validate, doesn't mean you have to affirm and agree with somebody else's perception. What it means is that you begin to say, I understand why this is important to you. So all the great research that's been done on sacred values find that when you give a symbolic concession to somebody who has a sacred value, doesn't mean that you're endorsing that view. You're saying, I understand how important this is to you and your, and your community. And that begins a cognitive shift where people are more willing to engage. So one is understanding the role of being understood. Second is context. That predictive brain that we all have requires context to navigate the world, particularly when we don't know the experience of others. I'll give an example. Several years ago, we were doing work trying to understand how to address growing Islamophobia in the United States. And so Emil and I were invited into a conference in DC almost 10 years ago, and we talked about brain and behavioral science. And the response was, well, what would a brain and behavioral science approach to dealing with Islamophobia look like? And one of the things Emil said afterwards is, we need to understand collective blame, blame, how our brain begins to collectively hold individuals or groups responsible for the behavior of individuals. Because as I mentioned earlier, we think automatically and we think in mental models of the world, which is also shaped not only by our experience, but the groups we belong to and the narratives that, the, that, that shape these groups. And what we found is that when you can overcome collective blame, you can create a shift. And I'll say very uh, quickly that in Spain and the United States, we did um, a series of studies and without telling anybody about how the brain works, so, for example, in the United States, when we ask Christian evangelicals, should all Christian evangelicals be responsible for what Timothy McVeigh did in the Oklahoma City bombing, their automatic response was no, he doesn't represent us. Then we asked the same question regarding Dylan Roof, who was the young white man who went into the Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston and killed those black parishioners. Is your community responsible for his behavior? And the automatic response is, no, he doesn't represent us. He's a crazy individual. And we did with a couple other examples. So once 
context was teed up in their brain without telling them ahead of time. The brain does its own thing. We then show them images of individuals, a young woman from Jordan, another person from Tunisia. Should Amina be responsible for what happened on 9-11? The automatic response is no. And the same with this next person. So what's happening in the brain is the brain now has context teed up within their own in-group and a mental model of their in-group. And then when shown an individual from the outside, the brain then processes hypocrisy and recognizes that would be hypocritical. And in both Spain and the United States, that 10 minute intervention lasted a year when they were shown petitions against Muslim immigration or other things that were, let's say, anti-Muslim in some degree or another, people said, no, I'm not gonna support that. And what that shows is that they're understanding not only how context works, but here's a key thing, understanding that we too often try to ascribe identities to others and what we see is resistance. And so if we can allow the brain to do its own function, we can actually advance real change. And I want to give that as an overarching um, perspective, because when we look at an issue, whether it's, you know, how do you deal with your past in a country like the United States and a deeply divided society? And I don't mean just divided politically, you know, in terms of all the different stories and narratives that different communities have in this country. Um, or look in Northern Ireland, for example, and many other places. I always stand back and ask the question, how do we think? Goes back to what a scientist said, focus on how we think about what we think and begin to tease out and test, is there a different way of approaching this particular problem based on how our psychology works? Okay, Tim, thank you. Um, this Here's a more particular question. Uh, as Palestinians, we have suffered from European settler colonialism and Europe and US wars, both as communities and as individuals. Western democracy has proved a weapon against us because we are not considered human in the Western thought. How do you propose changing this? My father, as a lawyer and later a judge in Palestine, used solha or traditional mediation and negotiations. The West ignored us. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, what we do see happening um, in the Middle East and Europe uh, is dehumanization. Um, and it can be this vicious cycle of dehumanization uh, that exists. Um, but a lot of these community-based processes, like what was just mentioned, are rooted in real understanding of, of, you know, how humans navigate a particular community. And what I find, and, and some of the research shows, that a lot of these um, sort of older community base have evolved over a long period of time because they were found to work, right? In, in many cases, it's not about shaming, right? It's not about stigmatizing. It's about finding a space for people to become whole again in the community. Um, and, you know, what's interesting, you know, if some of you may know in Rwanda, there's what's called the Kachacha system, Um for and after the Rwandan genocide, President Kagame and others really pushed for not just a community-based approach, but for perpetrators to meet with their victims who survived, family members or others who survived uh, directly uh, torture and, and violence. And one of the challenges there, and I had a chance to interview some of the survivors, is they felt sitting down with their perpetrator wasn't authentic. Because when they sought forgiveness, when they apologized, they didn't feel the process of that conversation was authentic to their experience. And, and so sometimes approaches that are manufactured could count, be counter, counterproductive. But other times they can be really helpful. And I, I saw a question in the, um, in the Q and A on contact theory. Um, as you know, contact theory is at the core of a lot of sort of conflict resolution mitigation work around the world. And in certain cases it can work, but in other cases it doesn't. And there's a robust research, Linda Tropp does really important work on contact theory. Uh, Betsy Levy Pollack has a lit review um, several years ago, she's at Princeton, that also challenged some, but not all of the assumptions around contact theory. And the big thing we know about contact theory is under the right conditions, it can work. And that's the key. And as I was saying about correcting misperceptions, 
is how do you, you know, correct people's false assumptions of the other, reduce the psychological cost of engaging with others before they actually come in contact with each other? I call that context before contact. And it goes to, you know, yes, contact can work, but again, tap into how the brain works, contextualize, contextualize, contextualize. Thank you, Tim. Um, here's uh, another question. How do you interact with others, for example, Iran, jihadists, who are committed to the extermination of your existence, peoplehood? Is there another easier question? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, that's a, I mean, that's a very, very difficult um, conversation. Um, you know, I go back to asking the question, like Donna, in the past when we would do more sort of conflict resolution work, as opposed to peace building work, sometimes you have to sit in a conversation with people who have done horrendous things. It's much easier, even though it's not easy, if you're not from that community or country. We could fly back to the United States. We could go into a place and, you know, try to create the conditions where people can make peace with their enemy. And people have done really horrendous things, not just that they hold, you know, very horrendous views, so to speak, but when they may have done things in a violent way, it's very difficult to have those conversations. And yet, if the goal, whether it was in Northern Ireland or Bosnia, is to stop the violence, to stop the killing, to begin to stabilize a community so there is no more of that violence. Then, and it doesn't mean everybody has to do that, but there are those, whether they be the negotiators or leaders of communities sitting across divides, have found that they need to sit down with those enemies to at least stop the violence and killing. And is it a requirement of people who feel threatened by the other side to do that? That's a personal choice. Um, it, it, without a doubt, there are people who deserve to be held criminally responsible. Without a doubt, there are people um, who do things um, in ways that um, almost are not redeemable. But one thing we know in conflict after conflict is there are people who get brought into those situations um, who, who change, who become, in a sense, allies, who recognize that what they did was wrong. And I was in Northern Ireland in April for the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. And I happen to be there with a film crew that's looking at lessons learned from Northern Ireland for the United States. And when I was leaving the hotel, there was a doorman who had a lot of tattoos. And he said to me, I've seen the cameras here for the last few days, what's going on? And I told him, you know, it's a, a film looking at lessons learned from Northern Ireland, from the United States. And he said to me, you know, and I said, well, it's 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement. What do you think now? He said, you know, I used to be a member of the loyalist within the Protestant paramilitaries. And he said, when I look back at what I believed, what I did, and what I defended, I'm ashamed. He said, I never imagined, looking back, that I have, could have ever done what I did. And he said, I have blood in my hands. I did horrendous things. But I realize now that there was a process that allowed people like me to find a way forward and to stand up against this ever happening again. And when I got in a taxi going to the train station to go to Dublin, the taxi driver, his father had been in the IRA and he said the same thing. And he said, you know, we were the victims of oppression, but I can't believe what we stood for and did 25 years ago. And so what I'm saying here is I would never tell somebody, you know, that they have to sit down with somebody who they feel is a direct threat. But I think one thing we've learned in the work is that, you know, as Yitzhak Rabin said, you make peace with your enemies. And, you know, and if you have violence, if you have violent conflict, if you have horrible acts of injustice and dehumanization happen, yes, you have to stand up and resist it, but you also have to create a space for others across those divides to change. Because there will always be people on the other side 
probably the majority who don't want to be part of the violence. Yeah, that's that's a tough one, um, Tim. Yeah. Um, going back to, um, let's see, hold on a second. Going back to the polarization that you talked about uh, in this country, this question is focused on that. Uh, since polarization is artificially fostered by social media, why do we allow it to happen? Should not we prove its major its malignancy, I guess, for peaceful co cohabitation and hence push for a better regulation in this regard? Well, you know, in the 1950s, um, political scientists in the United States were saying that the United States wasn't polarized enough. Their point was that the Democratic Republican parties had, you know, liberals, moderates, conservatives, and that the voter didn't have a real, you know, defining choice to make. Now, we've gone to the opposite side of polarization where it's become identity-based, us versus them. And it's without a doubt that media and social media are drivers of polarization, but there's actually research that, shit, that says it's not the primary driver of our polarization. It mm -hmm. reinforces it. The reality is we are polarized, right? And there are a number of reasons we are as a nation. And yet, you know, as a friend from another country pointed out to me three years ago, the vast majority of people in any country are not political. They don't wake up thinking about their cause. What they do is they wake up thinking about the day ahead. And whether in the United States or I saw in El Salvador or Northern Ireland or the Balkans or elsewhere, those people may have political views and strong ones, but they want the system to work. And it goes back to what we focused on in the America's Divided Mind Report is, you know, if people don't know that, because that's where the media reinforces the division, reinforces the fear, reinforces that we have nothing in common. How do we show people that we do? Because that's the only way to stabilize a nation. So we can't avoid polarization, you know, at its best. It's like conflict. It's inherent in our, in our DNA. Um, it's probably the wrong description, but it's inherent in our, you know, as I said to somebody, um, conflict is inherent in human nature and so is in cooperation. And yet cooperation is seen as a compromise. And yet cooperation is literally at a cellular level how life evolved in this planet. It's cooperation through shared mutual gain. And it means compromise. And I think we need to more and more be rooted in a recognition that we do have to find ways to live in this shared space, whether it's a community, whether it's a nation, whether in the United States, around the world. And we also have to learn that things like cooperation are deeply, deeply rooted in us. And that requires, to some extent, compromise. But it's also up to individuals to ask themselves, what do I feel comfortable compromising? And I'm not saying people should compromise in everything. I told you earlier about sacred values. Just feeling understood and seen um, is important for people to begin to have the space to say, OK, what can we discuss? Yeah, Tim, um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Oh. Um, we could go on for another session with this, if not two or three. So thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I apologize to everybody who uh, I, whose questions we didn't get to. Um, and we'll have to have you back another time. All right, so I'm going to turn this over to Nicole uh, Bryan, and she's going to give you an update on some upcoming events at uh, PON. Thank you so much, Donna, and thank you, Tim, and thank you to the 500 people who joined for this discussion. Um, very rich, and yes, we could have continued for another hour. Um, our next event at PON Live is actually in two days, a Valentine's uh, special, um, an inaugural event for our Roger Fisher speaker series, talking about the legacy of Roger Fisher, of course, the founder of the program on negotiation. Um, one, I should say one of the founders of the program on negotiation because it was indeed a collective effort. And then a, another event towards the end of the month with Avil Cesar, who, uh, and I will say that that event is, is so newly planned that the description is not even on our website yet, but details will be forthcoming. So mark your calendar and stay tuned. Of course, we hope to see you at all of our free events, as well as perhaps at a course either online or in person here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you to everyone. And again, 
to Donna and Tim and all of the staff here at the program on negotiation. We wish you a very pleasant day and uh, safety to everyone uh, about to undergo a snowstorm here on the East Coast of the United States. All right. Take care.